I'm incredibly disappointed in the men's rights movement. Human beings are rational animals, but that doesn't mean we're exclusively rational animals. Usually, instead of using reason to decide an issue, we have an immediate emotional reaction to it and use our faculties of reason to rationalize our response. Julia Turiansky, in her recent video on the men's rights movement, puts on as clear a display of reason in service of emotion as you are likely to see. Julia has some good videos on libertarianism, and she's even ventured to criticize feminism on a couple occasions, but her incredible disappointment with the men's rights movement indicates she is still, at heart, gynocentric. Gynocentric. Centric meaning put at the middle of, of increased importance or focus. Eurocentrism focuses on Europe. Afrocentrism focuses on Africa. Gynocentrism focuses on gynos. And if you don't know what those are, ask a gynecologist. For millions of years, human beings relied on men to fulfill certain roles. Roles which often required them to be strong, even sacrifice themselves. No tribe of Homo erectus was likely to survive if they let their baby makers take on any risk beyond the already dangerous peril of pregnancy. This arrangement is no longer necessary, but our genes don't know what century they're in. We still react to things on a gut level. Like when a man has problems and dares to complain about them, or, even worse, suggests that men as a group have problems that ought to be addressed. We prefer our men strong, independent, self-sacrificing, bold, and incapable of ever being a victim of anything ever. And we also adapted to more easily accept male sacrifice. When Julia complains about certain aspects of the men's rights movement, it's because her cerebral emotion center spasmed at insights that contradicted her core programming and demanded her intellect invent a few reasons with a veneer of plausibility as to why it was proper to react so negatively to the MRM. This explains why, at times, you could be forgiven for thinking she was Jessica Valenti. In fact, over the course of the video, each time she sounds like a feminist, I'll give her a Femi point. You'll be disturbed to see how many goals she scores as she throws open the gates and lets her gynocentrism gush over the microphone and into your ears. There are moments when she's about one free bleed and a bottle of purple hair dye away from mutating into a woman's studies major. Feminists loathe masculinity and are intensely self-absorbed. Give a feminist a mirror to sit on and you won't hear from her for 24 hours. Julia doesn't loathe masculinity... In fact, she seems to yearn for your grandfather's style of traditional masculinity. And she has too much good sense not to recognize feminism as the shitshow carnival that it is. But she does seem to share feminist self-absorbed gynocentrism. Like any reactionary movement, it would not exist in the first place if there wasn't a real problem to react to. And again, like most reactionary movements, it was bound to mutate and become bastardized eventually. But this fast? Okay. So Julia's thesis is that the men's rights movement has some legitimate points to make, but the natural corrupting process that happens to all movements happens surprisingly quickly in the MRM. We can't give her a Femi point yet because she admitted we have some legitimate issues, but let's see what she does with this. Factions of the men's rights movement and even some of its foundational principles have been radicalized and pushed towards the brink of absurdity. Radicalized. Let's pause for one moment to reflect on the fact that Julia Turiansky believes government should be abolished and that the market should provide all goods and services, including protection, investigation, law enforcement, and arbitration. Please understand, I agree with her. We are both anarcho-capitalists. But this does make it odd for her to fling the word radical at MRAs like it is some kind of insult. The men's rights movement is radical. Of necessity. Because the rest of humanity believes in a world that is quite simply fiction, and we want to open their eyes to the real world. Welcome to the real world. That's why we call it taking the red pill. The rest of the world believes human civilizations are patriarchies in which women are an oppressed class. They believe it so strongly 
they cannot see the easily provable truth. Human civilizations have always placed more importance, if not more freedom, on women than men, and that a man had to earn his importance an opposite person of the contradictory gender was born with it. Hence the phrase, women are human beings, while men are human doings. I think Julia calls it radicalized just to fling a scary word at us. Why? Probably because it sounds scary. Let's focus instead on her contention that we have become absurd. Something that started out, in my opinion, as a voice for males reacting to the radicalization of the feminist movement. Eh, that's part of it. But we're not just a movement that opposes feminism. We also oppose traditionalism and its version of gynocentrism. Feminists and traditionalists hate each other like the Montagues and the Capulets, but we MRAs say a plague on both their houses. Gynocentrism is the real enemy. And speaking out against total inequality and in specific realms of our society is now in a very rapid decline to the level of radical feminism, which is pretty low. Well, she still doesn't get any femi points because she recognizes radical feminism is pretty low. But the men's rights movement is in a rapid decline to that level? Do we preface our every speech with trigger warnings for the delicate of skin? Do we snap instead of clap because clapping is too aggressive? Do we free bleed or something roughly equivalent? Do we piss our pants for social justice? Do we redefine hateful words so only our opponents can be tagged with them? Have you ever gone to see the penis monologues? And you think the MRM is approaching that level of absurdity? And you would have us believe this on no evidence whatsoever, because in the entirety of your video, you never once bother us with any specifics. Later on, you list a few prevalent opinions in the men's rights movement and explain why you disagree with them, but you never cite a single instance of a single MRA behaving anything like the barbaric bullshit we just saw. I'm sorry, Julia, but you're in the middle of an emotional reaction, and your neocortex has been appropriated by your lizard brain for its personal use and won't be available for any real analysis until you calm down. What follows is a short bit where Julia makes some grade school taunts about where she thinks the MRM is headed. We can skip it, and she earns her first Femi point. At least feminism had a lot of help in its demise. It was co-opted and perverted uh, and utilized for a divide and conquer strategy that served the power hierarchy. The men's rights movement seems to have done this all on its own. Let's stop it right there to make her face look funny. At least feminism had a lot of help in its demise. The men's rights movement seems to have done this all on its own. So, really, the feminists were superior to the MRAs. They just got co-opted and corrupted. We went to shit without any outside influence. The female hypoagency is so thick, I almost choked on it. Female hypoagency refers to the very common tendency in our species to refuse to see a woman as an adult actor to refuse to trust women with making their own decisions, as well as to require them to take responsibility for their actions. Julia would have us believe that feminism isn't really infested with hateful bigots, loopy whack jobs, and strident whiners. The movement just got co-opted. But who's responsible for the feminist movement getting co-opted? Did feminists have no say in the matter? It's true the communists targeted the feminist movement for infiltration, but it's not like they chose it to set themselves a challenge. Read what the women at Seneca Falls had to say in 1848. The commies picked a field with fertile soil to sow their brand of lunacy, which was to destroy the family unit. Julia says the commies drove the feminists crazy, but as my grandfather used to say, that's not a drive, it's a putt. And I'm still waiting to hear why she's so disappointed in the men's rights movement. At some point, she needs to interrupt this stream of calumny and lay some specifics on us. Julia goes on to list some of the common positions and arguments in the men's rights movement, which she finds sound. She makes a pretty solid case against circumcision, argues for shared parenting, makes a quick comment about child support abuse, recognizes that boys are discriminated against in our educational system, points out how much more attention breast cancer gets than prostate cancer, although she's reluctant to credit sexism for this, which is odd since the breast cancer-prostate cancer gap is not the only such gap that favors women in medicine, acknowledges the seriousness of false rape accusations, and toes the standard libertarian line against the draft. 
And then... Now I'm going to talk about some of the things that the men's rights movement pushes that make me just never want to credit them with anything logical ever again. It's worth noting that our arguments with which she disagrees make her want to never credit us with anything logical ever again, rather than our arguments with which she agrees making her overlook our points of disagreement. And I understand that this isn't a unified movement and there's different strands and factions and opinions, but I'm still gonna acknowledge some of the retardedness that goes on. Domestic violence. Yes, I do think we need to acknowledge that there are men who are abused by their female spouse physically. But to claim that it happens just as much as it happens to a female is plainly insane. Plainly insane. No empiricism needed, apparently. Now, this isn't because I have a female bias. No, the thought never crossed my mind. This is because of observable truths about our biology. Women are the physically weaker sex. For an average man to hurt an average woman takes almost no effort. For an average woman to hurt an average man takes a lot of effort. The males have an advantage in a domestic violence situation. There are exceptions, there's women that are large and men that are small, but generally speaking, that is the observable biological truth. So to claim that there's just as much physical domestic violence from women against men is totally bonkers. So Julia is willing to observe that men are stronger than women. What she is not willing to observe is the actual level of female violence in relationships, which I would have thought was the only way to discover how much there is. Instead, she makes a prediction based on one relevant factor out of many. Men are stronger than women. Therefore, Julia predicts that men batter their female partners more often than they are battered by them. But the only way to know if her prediction is right is to observe how much violence there actually is, right? Strength is not the only relevant factor. Not every situation of domestic violence is a cage match where the contestants come out swinging at the bell. One partner might be stronger, but the other might be more aggressive. One partner might make a surprise attack. One partner might be biologically programmed not to hit members of the other sex. One partner might use a weapon to even the odds. Both partners might have been conditioned all their lives by, say, television shows, which often show a woman being violent to her partner, but almost never show a man being violent to his. One partner might know he is far more likely to be arrested, while the other feels she has free reign to punch, scratch, bite, claw, gnaw, headbutt, elbow, knee, and kick to her heart's content. There are so many factors involved, and Julia looks at one of them and makes a prediction from it. It would be like watching a football game and noting that one team had better linebackers than the other, and therefore they clearly must have won. Why not just look at the scoreboard? They quote statistics. <laughs> those bastards. Poor Julia just wanted to take a stroll through Fantasyland, and those goddamn MRAs kept throwing reality in her face. And I'm going to read you something that sums up the validity of those statistics. It turns out that these statistics of male abuse, hard and numerical as they are, were gathered by dubious means. When men are identified in police reports as abusers, that is, when women have been sufficiently battered for the police to take an interest, they are frequently questioned later and asked the leading question of whether they were also abused by their partner. Given the opportunity, they are often happy to report that in fact they were, although they seldom report serious or even noticeable injuries. Usually, the quid for which the beating or killing was the quo turns out to have been speech or shoving or slapping. Yet these reports are becoming part of the truth about spousal abuse that is reported in the media. And that's how strong cognitive dissonance is. Most people will do almost anything to relieve themselves of its discomfort. I once pointed out to a skeptical feminist there were hundreds of studies with a total sample size of hundreds of thousands from all over the world demonstrating that violence in relationships is pretty even. Her response? Those studies were done by men. Here was a woman who didn't even know of the existence of these studies until two seconds earlier telling me who carried them out and thus suggesting that only women were fit to study intimate partner violence. Such is the power of cognitive dissonance. Julia is suffering from it. 
She doesn't turn herself into quite the retard the feminist I was arguing with was, but her goal is still the same. Dismiss the heretical facts and move on. With one flick of the hand, she wants to sweep away all observations of gender parity in intimate partner violence because some of them might have used flawed methodology. So let's give Julia her femi point for denying female instigated violence in intimate partner relationships and take a look at the critical flaws in her rebuttal. 1. She's only uncovered a possible problem. The men in this methodology have an incentive to lie. I expect some of them did. But what percentage actually were lying, or at least embellishing? It's not enough to show they had reason to lie, you have to show that they did. Until then, we don't know. Hanging in the balance is the possibility of actually getting some domestic violence shelters for men. How many do we need? We won't find out by behaving like Julia, who merely wants a pretext to dismiss the prevalence and seriousness of female violence. 2. While this methodology certainly is flawed, Julia neglects to consider that the men themselves were originally chosen through flawed methodology. Police are trained to handle domestic violence according to the Duluth model, which, among other things, instructs officers to arrest the so-called dominant aggressor. But the dominant aggressor is defined in such a way that they might as well say arrest the one with the penis. Indeed, when a man calls the police after being attacked by his partner, he is more likely to be arrested than she is. So, according to Julia, we must believe the man was violent when he is arrested, but we must disbelieve the woman was violent when the arrested man says she was. 3. And most important, this methodology does not apply to all the hundreds of studies collected at this website, not even close. Here's a study with a sample size of 11,000, where a representative sample of men were asked whether or not their female partners had been violent to them, and whether or not the men themselves had been violent to their female partners. Disturbingly, about a quarter of relationships had violence, and in half of those the violence was mutual. But in 70% of the ones where violence was one way, it was the female who was violent. And the kicker? The study included a representative sample of women whose answers agreed with the men. The women were reporting their own violence. And no, we're not equating a female slap with a male swing of a sledgehammer. When violence is divided into categories of severity, the sexes are equally represented in all categories. Explain that away, Julia. Yes, women slap and push guys around, kicking them, whatever. I've seen the videos. But the guy can easily defend himself by restraining her or leaving unless she's using a weapon. And this is my answer to that. So, my ex-girlfriend... And she just beat me up because I don't want to be with her anymore. I just called the police on this bitch. And she outside right now. She just fucking cut me, punched me in my nose. But you know what? I'm still a man. I ain't no punk ass man because I ain't hit her back. I ain't hit her back. She bust my fucking lip. She bust my nose. And she cut me and shit with this uh, blade and shit. And she out here. I'm calling the police on you. I'm calling the police on you. Get a fuck away from me. Get a fuck away from this car, bitch. You crazy. You crazy, bitch. Look what you did in my face. Look what you did in my face. Fuck you. I'm calling the police. The police is on this way. The police. Get off the fucking car. Don't break my fucking window. It's a shame Julia wasn't there to tell him to restrain her. Notice what's going on in this sickening video. We don't get a chance to see if she's bigger than him. She's almost certainly not. Yet look at the damage she did. Remember those other factors mentioned earlier? She used a weapon, and he refused to hit her back even after she cut him with scissors and bloodied his nose with a punch. And if she can do that, so can many other women. Which is why you can't just look at physical size and strength to predict levels of violence. Which is why it's not at all unreasonable to state that intimate partner violence is roughly equal between women and men, especially with so many studies backing the claim which is why it is ridiculous to claim that MRAs are sinking to the level of feminism because we correctly point out that intimate partner violence is not a gendered problem. There's another facet of this I find just as disturbing. You see, Julia claims to be a libertarian, but she's apparently a very imperfect one. Libertarians do not accept positive obligations unless they are contractually agreed to. Yet, here Julia is claiming men have an obligation to restrain women who are being violent to them? Or to vacate the area to get away from their violence? 
That might fly in some circles, but it's anathema to libertarians. By the libertarian philosophy, if someone is violent to you, they have no right to complain when you are violent back to them, when you treat them by the same rules they chose to treat you. Of course, there does need to be a sense of proportionality, and Julia correctly points this out in her video, but she goes further than that. She claims that men should just leave, or at most restrain the women attacking them. Let's forget for a second that Julia has obviously never been in a fight. I want you to hit me as hard as you can. Or even a wrestling match, and has no appreciation for the sacrifice and, frankly, danger that must be assumed by the one who restrains a violent attacker, even a weaker one. We are still stuck with the awkward observation that Julia is violating her libertarian principles by advocating a positive obligation for men. If Julia had her way... Society would consist of one group of people who, due to their birth, are forced to accept the violence of another group of people who, due to their birth, are privileged to deal out the violence. Think about that for a second. Far from advocating for men's right to hospitalize women who slap us, men's rights advocates simply want equality before the law and at a social level. An opposite person of the contradictory gender should not be entitled to deal out violence to a man when it suits her and privileged to suffer no violence in return. I think Julia just earned another Femi point. Hey, she's got a hat trick. There's no reason to justify punching a woman back. Look at the size of your arm compared to the size of her arm. Hypo agency, thy name is Turiansky. Here's an idea. How about she look at the size of his arm compared to hers before she hits him? Or is that asking too much of an adult female? I've also heard the men's rights movement claiming that men are just as frequently raped as women. Yeah, by other men. No. No, no, she, she, didn't, she didn't just say that. No, no, she... I don't care what you heard, she didn't say that. She's a libertarian. She absolutely did not. It may have sounded like it, but I assure you, Julia did not just say what she said. There's no way. And even if she did say it, she certainly didn't coat each word in juvenile snark. No! No, 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 no. Take back the Femi point. Take it back. She, she didn't say it. Look, rewind the tape. I've also heard the men's rights movement claiming that men are just as frequently raped as women. Yeah, by other men. All right, who are you going to believe? Your lion ears? There's a huge, undeniable issue in prisons, and nobody cares because they're prisoners and we have a terrible system. That's a whole thing in and of itself. Oh, and guess what? It's, again, not about sexism against men because there are male security guards in female prisons who routinely rape the female prisoners. I'm pretty sure the abuse in prisons is pretty equal when it comes to sexes. Well citation needed, but yeah, you're probably right. But the path to prison for men is pretty well greased by the system. Women have to do a whole lot more, a whole lot more often, just to get there. Mike Buchanan has pointed out that in England, there are over 80,000 male prisoners and only 4,000 female ones. But if men were treated by the criminal justice system with the same tenderness with which women are treated, meaning less likely to be arrested, less likely to be prosecuted once arrested, more likely to be offered plea deals once prosecuted, less likely to be convicted on the same evidence, and more likely to receive a lesser sentence once convicted, there would only be 13,000 male prisoners in England. That certainly sounds sexist to me. And as for this, I think we need to talk about the difference between a noun and a verb. A noun is a thing. A verb is an action performed by a thing. Sexist behavior means verbs, doing sexist things. Big government is a noun, but it's a noun that is verbing sexistly. So big government is a problem because it behaves in a sexist manner in matters of criminal justice. So it's also a problem of sexism against men. The two aren't mutually exclusive. Remember that argument you made against circumcision a few minutes ago? during that stretch of time when your video was not inducing nausea? To circumcise is a verb. Hospital is a noun, a metonym in this case, that does the circumcising. Now, you admitted that circumcision was a legitimate men's rights issue. Yet, if we were to use the logic from your prison example, 
we would conclude that circumcision is not a sexism problem, it's a hospital problem, despite the fact that it is, in our country, exclusively performed on males. Using twisted logic to dismiss a legitimate men's rights issue? Femi point. Now in the next clip, you're going to- I've also heard advocates for blacks claiming that blacks are the most likely to be murdered. Yeah, by other blacks. I am so embarrassed. I don't know why my computer did that. That's terrible. I mean, what possible relevance does it have that most of the criminals victimizing innocent blacks are themselves black? Is my computer suggesting that innocent blacks, the most likely members of our society to be the victims of a crime, are at fault for sharing a skin tone with the criminals who abuse them? Is it suggesting that the issue can be dismissed as unimportant because the criminals resemble their victims? Should blacks not advocate for themselves just because most of their victimizers are black or some stupid shit like that? Jesus Christ, my computer is racist. We should acknowledge that there are different hotspots in our limbic systems that are activated during sexual arousal depending on your gender. No way. For females, it's mostly the ventral medial hypothalamus, which is also a hotspot for estrogen and progesterone. For men, it's the medial preoptic area, which is also a hotspot for testosterone and androgen. Both of these areas are in the hypothalamus. The difference is that in men, the amygdala also plays a small role in their sexuality. The medial preoptic area guides the performance of sexuality, and the amygdala creates motivation. The scary thing is the amygdala is also the center for aggression in males. This just might explain why there is a much higher propensity for males to confuse sex with violence. Citation needed. There is good reason to believe that women's propensity to rape is not all that far behind men's, and this is another case where men's and women's answers were largely in agreement. Julia has a real knack for taking one relevant fact, isolating it, making a prediction out of it, and then calling her prediction an established fact. Men's amygdala plays a role in aggression as well as sex, so men must, how did she put it, confuse sex and violence more. Sounds like a plausible enough hypothesis, but this sociological extrapolation from biological discovery is fraught with complications. For instance, it is well known there is a link between testosterone and aggression. Therefore, we should be able to measure testosterone levels in individuals and predict how aggressive their behavior will be. But we can't. There must be more going on. It is well known that brain size is a good predictor of intelligence and species. There is also something of a correlation between an individual's brain size and his or her intelligence. So, given that men have larger brains than women, men must be more intelligent. But we're not. Most studies have concluded men and women have the same mean and median intelligence, as measured by an IQ test. So must men be more rapey because our amygdala is involved in our sexual arousal? No, not necessarily. While men do commit more rapes, the difference is nowhere near as large as Julia no doubt believes. And it must be because there is more going on. For instance, Women might have more of a sense of entitlement to get sex when they want it. Men might have a natural instinct not to assault a woman. The mere involvement of the amygdala might not actually make men more violent about sex. You know, other relevant factors. The scary thing is the amygdala is also the center for aggression in males. The scary part? Julia? I hope you're a lesbian, so you don't have to be sexually attracted to something as scary as a man. Let's give her another Femi point. Testosterone is involved in aggression. The scary part is that blacks have more testosterone than whites. Did that sound racist? It did, didn't it? Huh. Julia also... I've also heard feminists claim that women are more likely to be slut-shamed for sexual behavior. Yeah, by other women. I am so sorry. I don't understand why. Uh, that's just awful. Th this was a rescue computer, and I think it got mistreated when it was young, and obviously we've got a lot to work on. Who cares if most slut shamers are women? Is my computer suggesting women are at fault for the slut shaming aimed at them simply because they have the same genital organ as most of the people shaming them? 
Is it saying the issue is not important because the victimizers resemble their victims? Should advocates for women ignore the issue just because women are the majority of the problem? Or some bullshit like that? Good Christ, my computer is sexist, too. Prison sentences. Yes, uh, men get longer sentences than women on average. I don't think this is a result of intended discrimination. I think judges and jurors are used to seeing more men commit violent crimes, which they do. Uh, so when a woman does it, it's just something they're not used to. It's just something that's not as normalized in society, from which follows that they give her a lighter sentence. Intended? What kind of weasel word is that? Did you think you could slip that in there without us noticing? Clever girl. We're talking about the issues you think are invalid and for which the MRM is ridiculous for advocating. Are you suggesting MRA should stop talking about the fact that men are treated more harshly by the justice system at every step of the way simply because you claim on nothing more substantial than your own personal hunch that the discrimination was not intended? We've already been down this road. Let's wrap this up. The justice system discriminates against men. Either women are treated too leniently and are getting away with crimes they should not, or men are treated too harshly and being punished way too hard for their crimes. Or a little of both. It doesn't really matter which for our purposes here, because it's a proper men's rights issue no matter what, and we're not sinking down to the level of feminism by pointing it out. And sometimes being a woman actually hurts you because of that expectation for women being less violent. Like Pamela Smart's case. Pamela Smart didn't even kill anybody. She was alleged to have influenced three young males to kill her husband. Yet, she got a longer sentence than Charles Manson. Oh, she didn't actually kill anyone. Like Joseph Stalin himself. And because of this one case of a woman getting a long sentence, I guess we can throw out all the other cases where men are treated more harshly. Clearly, because of Pamela Smart, the men's rights movement is sinking to the level of feminism by pointing out that the Pamela Smart case is an exception and not the rule. Femi point. I've also heard humanists claim that human beings are assaulted, kidnapped, raped, and murdered by the millions every year all across the planet. Yeah, by other humans. Oh my god. My computer's a speciesist. That's ridiculous. Does my computer honestly think that just because most of the animals who victimize humans are also humans, that we shouldn't advocate for... All right, you get the idea. Here's the one I have the biggest problem with. In 2006, the American National Center for Men backed a lawsuit known as Debay v. Wells. The case concerned whether men should have the opportunity to decline all paternity rights and responsibilities in the event of an unplanned pregnancy. Okay guys, that's fucking retarded. Let me explain a hate fact to you. When you engage in intercourse, there is a possibility you will have a baby. No way. Even though most of the time you engage in intercourse, it's proximal, meaning it feels good. That doesn't change the underlying motivation, which is distal, which means to pass on your genes. No matter how you spin it or dress it up or rationalize it, intercourse at its foundation is for the purpose of creating babies. Whether both of your expectations were that this is just for fun, whether she told you that she was on birth control and she wasn't, whether your condom slipped off, whether you forgot to pull out, doesn't matter. You participated in an act that has the possibility of resulting in a baby. I know that some women are pretty shitty and will lie about being on the pill and trick you into being the father of their child. Guess what, guys? You're still 50% responsible for that child, whether it was conceived out of love, by accident, or by a lie. Is that unfair? I don't think so. I'm pretty sure guys were smart enough to pull out before fire was invented. So just do that if you don't want to get a girl pregnant. Holy shit. Wow. I don't think I can give her a Femi point for this. Because I've talked to too many feminists, the kind who have a mild disdain for men but honestly don't think they do, who are less ridiculous on this topic. Way more reasonable than Julia Turiansky. 
Julia just said a man should be forced to pay for a child conceived through fraud and deception. Once again, her libertarian principles get tossed away. You know, Julia, libertarianism is not a boomerang. If you toss the principles away too often, they're not your principles anymore. In our society, when a woman gets pregnant, whether she wanted to or not, whether he tricked her or she tricked him or it was planned or an accident, whatever, when a woman gets pregnant, she has options. She can take a morning after pill. She can have an abortion later on. Even after the child is born, she can legally turn it over to an adoption agency and forego all rights and responsibilities. She has choices. He has none. He is beholden entirely to her decisions. And men's rights advocates rightly decry that as unfair and want to see legal equality between the sexes. Let me proceed on the assumption that you want legal equality too. There are two ways to get there. Either the man should have the right to force her to give birth to the child and pay for it just like she can do to him now. Do you really want that? Or he should have the same ability to choose not to parent a child as she has, even after conception. The libertarian position is pretty clear. Individuals should be able to determine their own consensual terms when they have sex. A woman can say, by having sex with me, you agree to abide by my decisions and financially support the child if I choose to raise it. She can do this because it's her body the man wants to play with, so he needs to follow her rules. The man can either agree to her terms or tell her to open her mouth because it ain't going in her baby maker. However, the man can give his own terms by which she must abide if she wants to hop on him. The only question is what to do if one party cannot prove what the agreement was, or what should be done if the parties did not come to terms but fucked anyway, or what the default position should be if they didn't bother to talk about it, which would probably be the most common. There are only two positions consistent with equality before the law. Either sexual intercourse is consent by both parties to raise a child, or it's not. If sex is consent to raise a child, we've got all kinds of problems. For one, it's not workable. The man has little chance of knowing she's pregnant if she doesn't want him to. She might be bound by contract, but there's no way to enforce it. She can pop a morning after pill and he'll be none the wiser, even though in reality she now owes him damages. Two, you run into the problem of men being able to force women to have babies they don't want to have, even if it's because she changed her mind. Consent is a two-way street, after all. The only answer consistent with biology, female autonomy over her own body, and just plain obvious decency is to allow both parties to refuse to be a parent if they don't want to be, unless they have entered into a contract, like a marriage. Those getting red flags right now, the pull-out method is actually more effective than condoms, just as effective as hormonal birth control when done properly. How to do it properly. Well, you pull out before you ejaculate. The only way to mess this up is if you don't pull out before you ejaculate, or if you ejaculate prior to sex without peeing in between. When you pee, the urine clears out the urethra and destroys any sperm that may be trapped in the tract. No way. If you don't pee and there's sperm trapped in the tract, then the pre-cum may impregnate the woman even if you pull out. So again, to reiterate to all of you who are confused, if you don't want to get a woman pregnant, have a pee then have sex with her and pull out before you ejaculate. Peeing right before sex is also an effective way to make sure you'll be the only one giving head on that particular evening. Another suggestion, if you really don't know her or she has a history of lying, or if you just want to be extra safe, also wear a condom. Yeah, because condoms don't fucking suck or anything. Give a man a circumcision and slip a condom on what's left of his dick and he might as well fuck her with a dildo. And pull out? Sure, why not lessen his pleasure right at the peak moment? And all because Julia thinks a woman should be able to coerce child payments from a man after lying to him and tricking him into getting her pregnant. For crying out loud, Julia's way actually incentivizes women to be dishonest. Also, on the subject of women being evil and tricking men into having babies with them, what about all the dudes who knock up a girl and she wants to get rid of it? And he says, no, baby, I love you. I want to be the daddy. Let's move in together. I'll support you, blah, blah, blah. Six months later or right after the baby is born or a year into it, dude runs away, never to be seen again. Um, it's a completely different problem. The solution to which in no way hampers our ability to address the concerns of MRAs. 
watch me solve both problems at once using libertarianism. A man who agrees to help raise a child and then skips out of town is in breach of contract. He must then, in a just society, be forced to pay damages to the person he was in contract with. These damages would, of course, amount to child support. For a man who did not agree to raise a child resulting from a pregnancy, we can treat him like an actual human being, almost as if he were a woman, and allow him the same choice she has, the choice not to parent a child if he doesn't want to. See? Both concerns addressed, both problems solved. We didn't have to use one concern to distract us from solving the other, like Julia. The men's rights movement is a growing movement of men and women who recognize that men are second-class citizens here in the West, and that gynocentrism is the reason for this. There are men in the movement who, for whatever reasons, are angry at women, and in many cases even hate them. I don't know what percentage of the movement could be said to hate women, but it's enough to fill up the comment sections of internet articles with some nasty vitriol. But every civil rights movement has this. Civil rights movements begin when enough is enough and people aren't putting up with any more bullshit. I'm as mad as hell and I'm not going to take this anymore! Julia admits as much. Anger is always a factor and many people don't handle their anger well. Does anyone really think the black civil rights movement has no racists? The rank and file of the men's rights movement is diverse. And there are men who either hate women or do an impressive job portraying women haters on the internet. Women are cunts incapable of loving men, gold-digging whores, selfish, blah blah blah. But look at what rank-and-file feminists do. They attack churches in Argentina, behaving like animals. They call in bomb threats to Aaron Pitsy, who started the first battered women's shelter in the Western world, simply because she noticed that the women she tried to help were usually quite violent themselves and tried to start a men's shelter. They try to sabotage the career of a former feminist who quite to his surprise, discovered that women were as violent as men in relationships. They attend lectures of people with whom they disagree and shout them down. They try to intimidate students who want to attend a lecture that explores the problem of male suicide. They try to throw a man in jail for disagreeing with them on Twitter. Check out RadFemHub sometime, and you'll see tenured professors exploring the possibility of eradicating males entirely, or daycare workers talking about wanting to kill the male babies they take care of because of the putative privilege they are going to have in their lives. And Julia thinks the men's rights movement is sinking to the level of feminism because we want men to have the choice to refuse parenthood after conception, like women have, or because we think a man has the right to defend himself, even if his attacker is a woman? And what about the leaders of the respective movements? No MRA has defined rape in such a way as to preclude the very possibility that a man could ever rape a woman. No MRA has protested the female birth control pill. No MRA has produced dishonest studies to try to demonize the female sex. No MRA has ever shot women after writing The Society for Cutting Up Women and then been praised for it by another MRA. No tenured professor MRA has ever written a legal treatise arguing that men who kill their wives should not be held legally responsible for it. No MRA has suggested that all women should be put in concentration camps. A Voice for Men has never lobbied to give men presumptive custody in all divorce cases. No MRA has argued that every alleged rapist should be believed when he denies the crime. No MRA has sought to reduce the population of females to 10% of the total. Hell, even MGTOW don't do that. When Karen Strawn says she wants to see the feminist movement regarded in the same way as the KKK, I agree with her. Because if what I listed above does not make for a hate movement, what the hell does it take? Julia Turiansky has utterly failed to show that MRAs are sinking to the level of feminism. All she has done is disagree with the men's rights movement on a few issues, while agreeing on others, and provide some pretty poor argumentation for why she disagrees. She talked about circumcision, shared parenting, medical research, false rape accusations, the draft, domestic violence, criminal justice, and child support. Now, out of all these topics, which are the two you think are most likely to affect Julia personally? I don't think false rape accusations are a big part of her life, and neither is circumcision. But child support? Or domestic violence? Those seem like real issues for a young woman like Julia. 
and those were two of the three where she split with the MRM position. Karen Strawn has remarked that it is not unheard of for a feminist to concede that men have issues, and some will even advocate for men from time to time, but what you almost never see is a feminist advocating for men on an issue that would require women to give up the privileges they enjoy simply for being born with a yang instead of a yin. It costs the feminist next to nothing to oppose circumcision. And indeed, I've heard many feminists do exactly that. But arguing for men to have the right to refuse to parent or support a child, as women have? No, sir, that cuts into female privilege. Arguing that men have the right to defend themselves and have no positive obligation to restrain a violent woman or to leave and let her have the area? That also cuts into female privilege. And that's exactly where Julia parts company with the men's rights movement. Watch Julia's other videos sometime. From what I've seen, she opposes feminism because she doesn't like the damage feminism has done to women. On the damages it has done to men, she says precious little. And when men and women have the temerity to demand equality in an area that would necessitate the curtailment of female privilege, she likens us to a hate movement. That is gynocentrism. That is a woman who prefers women to men, notwithstanding any mewling protests she raises to the contrary. I've also heard Romulists claim that Romulans have been invaded, captured, and enslaved in concentration camps. Yeah, by other carbon-based life forms. Okay, now you're just getting ridiculous.